students and welcome to Mr. Sandwich Reads. I am, of course, Mr. Sandwich, and today we are going to finish the Odyssey. We are reading Odysseus's Revenge, and then we're going to read Penelope Tess's Odysseus. Um, there are some questions to go along with that, so make sure you answer those when you're done. And uh, when I'm done reading the passage, I'll go over those questions as well. But let's jump on in. Let me use Read Write to get the scroller going, my reading scroller. Odysseus's Revenge. Now shrugging off his rags, the wiliest fighter of the islands, leapt and stood on the broad door sill, his own bow in his hand. He poured out his feet, a rain of arrows from the quiver, and spoke to the crowd. So much for that, your clean-cut game is over. Now watch me hit a target that no man has hit before. If I can make this shot, help me, Apollo. He drew to his first he drew to his fist the cruel head of an arrow for Antinous. Just the young man leaned, just as the young man leaned to lift his beautiful drinking cup, embossed, two-handled, golden. The cup was in his fingers. The wine was even at his lips. And did he dream of death? How could he? In that revelry, amid his throng of friends, who would imagine a single foe, though a strong foe indeed? could dare to bring death's pain on him and darkness on his eyes. Odysseus's arrow hit him under the chin and punched up the feathers through his throat. Backward and down he went, letting the wine cup fall from his shocked hand. Like pipes, his nostrils jetted crimson runnels, a river of mortal red. And one last kick upset his table, knocking the bread and meat to soak in dusty blood. Now, as they craned to see their champion where he lay, the suitors jostled in uproar down the hall, everyone on his feet. Wildly, they turned and scanned the walls in the longest room for arms. But not a shield, not a good ashen spear was there for a man to take and throw. Remember, that's because Telemachus hid them. All they could do was yell in outrage at Odysseus. Foul to shoot at a man, that was our, your last shot. Your own throat will be slit for this. Our finest lad is down. You killed the best in Ithaca. Buzzards will tear your eyes out. For they imagined as they wished that it was a wild shot, an unintended killing. Fools not to comprehend, they were already in the grip of death. But glaring under his brows, Odysseus answered, You yellow dogs, you thought I'd never make it home from the land of Troy. You took my house to plunder. You dared bid for my wife while I was still alive. Contempt was all you had for the gods who rule wide heaven. Contempt for what men say of you hereafter. Your last hour has come. You die in blood. As they all took this in, sickly green fear pulled at their entrails, and their eyes flickered, looking for some hatch or hideaway, hideaway from death. Uh, Eurymachus alone could speak. He said, if you are Odysseus of Ithaca, come back. All that you say these men have done is true. Rash actions, many here, more in the countryside. But here he lies, the man who caused them all. Antinous was the ringleader who whipped us on to do these things. He cared less for a marriage than the power of Cronion has denied him as king of Ithaca. For that he tried to trap your son and would have killed him. He is dead now and has his portion. Spare your own people, as for ourselves, we'll make restitution of wine and meat consumed and add each one a tithe of twenty oxen with gifts of bronze and gold to warm your heart. Meanwhile, we cannot blame you for your anger. One of the questions to post to you is, uh, um, what is it that uh, Eurymachus here tries to convince Odysseus, or, or why does he try to uh, convince, or how, excuse me, does he try to convince Odysseus to spare the lives of the rest of the suitors and restate his argument? What are his reasonings? Um, and if we see here in this passage, we can go to like line 1245, rash actions here lies. So in 1247, Antinous was the ringleader. So he's saying the person responsible that uh, whipped up this um, sort of uh, attempt to uh, 
take the throne here was Antinius, that Antinius was really behind it, and that as for the rest of them, they'll pay back what they've taken in wine and food. What do we think? Is uh, Odysseus going to go for that? Let's see. Odysseus uh, glowered under his black brows and said, No, for the, not for the whole treasure of your fathers. All you enjoy, lands, flocks, or any gold put up by others, would I hold my hand. There will be a killing to the score is paid. You forced yourselves upon this house. Fight your way out or run for it if you think you'll escape death. I doubt, I doubt one man of your skins by. They felt their knees fail in their hearts, but heard Eurymachus for the last time rallying them. Friends, he said, the man is impla implacable. Now that he's got his hands on bow and quiver, implacable, is implacable? I'm going to have to look that one up. The man is implacable. Now that he's got his hands on his bow and quiver, he'll shoot from the big doorstone there until he kills us to the last man. Fight, I say. Let's remember the joy of it. Swords out. Hold up your tables to deflect his bow, his arrows. After me, everyone, rush him where he stands. If we can budge him from the door, if we can, if we can pass into the town, we'll call out men to chase him. This fellow with his bow will shoot no more. He drew his own sword as he spoke, a broad sword of fine bronze, honed like a razor on either edge, then crying hoarse and loud. He hurled himself as at Odysseus. But the kingly man let fly an arrow at that instant, and the quivering feathered butt sprang to the nipple of his breast as the barb stuck in his liver. The bright broadsword clanged down. He lurched and fell aside, pitching across his table. His cup, his bread, and meat were split and scattered, scattered far and wide, and his head slammed on the ground. Revulsion, anguish in his heart, with both feet kicking out. He downed his chair while the shrouding wave of mist closed on his eyes. Amphinomus, Amphinomus now came running at Odysseus, broadsword naked in his hand. He thought to make the great soldier give way at the door, but with a spear throw from behind, Telemachus hit him between the shoulders, and the lance head drove clear through his chest. He left his feet and fell forward, thudding forehead against the ground. Telemachus swerved around him, leaving the long, dark spear planted in Amphinomus. If he paused to yank it out, someone might jump him from behind or cut him down with a sword. At the, the moment he bent over, so he ran, ran from the tables to his father's side and halted, panting, saying, Father, let me bring you a shield and spear, a pair of spears, a helmet. I can arm on the run myself. I'll give outfits to Eumaeus uh, and this cowherd better to have equipment. Said Odysseus, run then while I hold them off with arrows, as long as the arrows last. When all are gone, if I'm alone, they can dislodge me. Quick upon his father's word, Telemachus ran to the room where spears and armor lay. He caught up four light shields, four pairs of spears, four helms of war, high plumed with flowing manes, and ran back, loaded down to his father's side. He was the first to pull a helmet on and slide his bare arm in a buckler strap. The servants arms themse armed themselves, and all three took their stand beside the master of battle. While he had arrows, he aimed and shot, and every shot brought down one of his huddling enemies. But when all barbs had flown from the bowsman bowman's fist, he leaned his bow on the bright entryway. Beside the door, and armed, a four-ply shield hard on his shoulder and crested helm, horse-tailed, nodding stormy upon his head, then took his tough and bronze-shod spears. Odysseus, Telemachus, and the two faithful servants killed every suitor. Several times Athena saves Odysseus's life by turning aside the suitor's deadly blows, and Odysseus looked around him, narrow-eyed for any other who had lain hidden while death's black fury passed. In blood and dust he saw that crowd had all fallen, many and many slain. Think of a catch that fishermen haul in to a hot half-moon bay in a fine mesh net from the white caps of the sea, how all are poured out on the sand in throes 
for the salt sea, twitching their cold lives away in Helios's fiery air. So lay the suitors heaped on one another. Oh boy, so Odysseus gets his revenge here. Uh, at what point in this episode does Odysseus reveal his identity to the suitors? Uh, Eurymachus tries to convince Odysseus to spare the suitors' lives, restate the argument in his own words. We talked about that. That was on like uh, 1245, was around the line. What does that, uh, what reason does Odysseus give for refusing? You want to include that. Uh, do you think Odysseus's revenge is excessive? That's really an opinion, but uh, give reasons to support your opinion. And why are the stringing of Odysseus's bow and the slaying of the suitors considered the climax of the story? Um, something to consider there. It's the, the climax would be the high point in the story. So we've got rising action, rising action. We talked about all those events leading up to. Uh, so why would this be the high point? And then uh, next we're going to read uh, Penelope tests Odysseus and we'll see the resolution uh, to the story. All right, so there you have it. That was Odysseus' Re Revenge. Take a moment now to answer those four questions. Hello, students. We're back. Hopefully you answered the questions there for Odysseus' Revenge. If not, do that in a moment here as we finish the last passage of the Odyssey. This is Penelope tests Odysseus. And uh, let me read off the questions you're going to answer here real quick. Uh, what does Penelope, or yeah, what does Penelope imply by the phrase, if man you are, in line 1356? Uh, what test does Penelope devise to tell whether the stranger is really Odysseus? And how does Penelope show that she and Odysseus are well matched? Some things to keep in mind as we read. So let's read, and then uh, I'll try to answer those questions with you. Okay. And let me just zoom in here. This is Penelope tests Odysseus. And this is just about a um, page and a half, two pages. Pretty quick. After 20 years of waiting for Odysseus, Penelope hesitates to acknowledge the stranger as her husband. She tests him with a secret only Odysseus could know. Great-hearted Odysseus, home at last, was being bathed now by Euronome and rubbed with golden oil and clothed again in a fresh tunic and a cloak. Athena lent him beauty, head to foot. She made him taller and massive, too, with crisping hair and curls like petals of wild hyacinth but all red golden. Think of gold infused on silver by a craftsman whose fine art Hephaestus taught him, Hephaestus being the god of metalworking, uh, or Athena, the one whose work moves to delight, just, just so she lavished beauty over Odysseus's head and shoulders. He sat then in the same chair by the pillar facing his silent wife and said, strange woman, the immortals of Olympus made you hard, harder than any. Who else in the world would keep aloof as you do from her husband if he returned to her from years of trouble, cast on his own land in the 20th year? Nurse, make up a bed for me to sleep on. Her heart is iron in her breasts. Penelope spoke to Odysseus now. She said, strange man, if man you are, and that's the line we want to interpret there. Strange man, if man you are, this is no pride on my part, nor scorn for you, not even wonder, merely. I know so well how you, how he appeared boarding the ship for Troy, but all the same, make him his bed for, make up his bed for him, Eurycle, place it outside the bed, bed chamber, my lord, built with his own hands, pile the big bed with fleeces, rugs, and sheets of purest linen. With this, she tried him to the breaking point, and he turned on her in a flash, raging, Woman, by heaven, you've stung me now. Who dared to move my bed? No builder had the skill for that unless a god came down to turn the trip. No mortal in his best days could budge it with a crowbar. There is our perfect pledge and pledge. This is our pact, excuse me, which is an agreement amongst a group. There is, this is, there is a, our pact and pledge, our secret sign built into that bed, my handiwork and no one else's. And if you remember uh, in the film adaptation we watched, it was built around uh, the tree. And, and here he mentions the olive, uh, olive tree. An old trunk of olive grew like a pillar on the building post. So the bed was immovable. So she mentions moving the bed outside. And he's like, this bed doesn't move. So um, you can't fool me. So that's kind of the secret that she's testing him with. Uh, is by mentioning moving the bed. And he's like, you can't move this bed. It's built around a, an olive tree trunk. 
and laid our bedroom round that tree, lined up the stone walls, built the walls and roof. They built this, the whole bedroom around, the whole house is around this tree. Uh, gave it a doorway and smooth fitting doors. Then I lopped off the silvery leaves and branches, hewed and shaped that stump from the roots up into a bedpost, drilled it, let it serve as model for the rest. I planed them all, inlaid them all with silver, gold, and ivory, and stretched a bed between a pliant web of oxhide thongs dyed crimson. There's our sign. I know no more. Could someone else's hand have sawn that trunk and dragged the frame away? Their secret, as she heard it told, her knees grew tr tremulous, uh, so trembled, and weak. Her heart failed her. With eyes brimming, tears, she, she ran to him, throwing her arms around his neck and kissed him, murmuring, Do not rage at me, Odysseus. No one ever matched your caution. Think what difficulty the gods gave. They denied us life together in our prime and flowing years, kept us from crossing into age together. Forgive me. Don't be angry. I could not welcome you with love on sight. I armed myself long ago against the frauds of men, impostors who might come, and all those many whose underhanded ways bring evil on. So she's saying, I had to make sure it was you. I've had so many people come in trying to uh, usurp the throne here at Ithaca. I had, to, I had to make sure before celebrating your arrival. But here and now, what sign could be so clear as this of our own bed? No other man ever has ever laid eyes on it. Only my own slave, Octorus, that my father sent with me as a gift. She kept our door. You make my stiff heart know that I am yours. Now, from his breast into his eyes, the ache of longing mounted, and he wept at last. His dear wife, clear and faithful, in his arms, longed as the sun-warmed earth is longed for by a swimmer. Notice she mentions, I just want to point out the hypocrisy, um, the double standard between men and women that that he's all, he's, he mentioned that the, it, it mentions her being loyal, but we know for a fact that um, Odysseus has not been loyal. Um, so double standard there, clear and faithful in his arms, he mentions long for the sun warmed earth uh, is long for by a swimmer spent in rough water where his ship went down under Poseidon's blows, gale winds and tons of sea. Few men can keep alive through a big surf to crawl clotted with brine on kindly beaches. Enjoy, enjoy knowing the abyss behind. And so she too rejoiced her gaze upon her husband, her white arms round him pressed though forever. So they lived happily ever after. And here we have a postscript, which tells us a little bit after the story, the story after the story. The following morning, Odysseus and Telemachus set out for the country estate of Laertes, Odysseus's father. Their happy reunion is interrupted by the arrival of angry relatives of the slain suitors armed for battle. Athena appears and commands them to make peace. So ends the Odyssey with Odysseus restored to his family and to his kingdom. All right, I hope you enjoyed the Odyssey. I know that as we evaluated Odysseus's leadership skills, he uh, was a questionable leader, a questionable hero. Um, well, let's take a look at the, um, and, and remember too, we watched a video with John Green who mentioned um, that the epic hero really was a celebration of one trait in particular. And in this trait, it would be, um, well, John, John Green mentions Metis, uh, M-E-T-I-S, but like skill of mind, he's crafty, he could think up a plan, he's strategic. Um, so yes, his hubris or his overconfidence does get them into trouble. Uh, he could have been a better communicator. He didn't save his crew, um, but he is, we did see with the Trojan horse, with the way out of the Cyclops, with the beeswax in the ears for his crew during the sirens. We see these moments of uh, cleverness that uh, Odysseus has. Uh, when Penelope implies, or what does she imply by the phrase, if man you are? Now, remember that one I'll answer with you. We talked about Xenia being the tradition of giving to strangers, especially wanderers, because you did not know if a stranger was actually a god or goddess in disguise. So um, I believe that's the implication there that Penelope is kind of like, same with Telemachus. Telemachus, remember, believes that he is a god because he transformed uh, into looking like a younger Odysseus. Um, so that's what I would guess there, that she is implying that maybe he's some trickster uh, in disguise or especially a god or goddess um, being deceitful. 
Uh, all right, then we got uh, Penelope devises to tell whether the stranger is really Odysseus. She mentions moving the bed outside of the room, which he knows cannot be done. And he mentions that. Um, and then how does Penelope show that she and Odysseus are well matched? Let me go back to the text for that one. Uh, let's see, following the reunion. Um, uh, well, she does mention, I had complained about the double standard, but she mentions no other man having laid eyes on the bed, uh, or in the room, only a slave of hers had ever seen, uh, this bed around the, uh, the olive tree. Um, so basically I would answer to that one that she is faithful to him. I don't know about well matched, but that she waited for 20 years to spend, um, their life together. And she kind of laments how, the time that they lost. You would think Athena could make her a little bit younger, too, since she made Odysseus a little younger. All right. Anyways, those are the questions. That is the Odyssey. I hope you enjoyed. And, uh, yeah, let me know what you think. Uh, and I hope you check out the Iliad, too, if you have interest in the Odyssey. All right. Thanks for following. Get those questions answered in the end.